Oh, good morning. Thank you so much. Wasn't Father Leo great this morning? That was so fun and so good. Uh, I am here to introduce my good friend, Deacon Ryan Sales. I met Deacon Ryan through Father Paul Cavanaugh, and we had the wonderful opportunity to go to Newman Theological College together. So Deacon Ryan is here because I asked him. Thank you. Good morning, my dear friends. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation by Father Leo, um, and I'm very excited for you for your next presentation after mine with Father Rob. Now, I know this uh, COVID situation isn't very fair as you all see me throughout the school. Um, I don't get to see you. I'm gonna give a big wave to the classrooms that I had the opportunity to spend some time with this morning. And, um, but it's a real honor to be here. I've been hearing amazing things about you all from Mrs. Halliday. And I hope one of these days that I get the opportunity to come back and spend more time with you in person. Now, Mrs. Halliday introduced me as Deacon Ryan. Uh, a little bit about me, I've been married to my wife, Anna, for 19 years. I have two kids, um, a foster son and a daughter, and we have four granddaughters, all under the age of four years old. I was ordained a deacon in 2018 in the Diocese of St. Paul, although right now I serve for the Military Ordinariate of Canada. Lots of people call me baby deacon. The reason why they do that is because I've only been ordained a deacon for three years, and I'm also a lot younger than most of the other deacons. I've served as the director of our diocesan summer camp, Camp St. Louis, and I've also worked as a chancellor, police and hospital chaplain, and um, many other positions in the church. Now, as some of you may know, deacons also have day jobs. And so I've worked for 25 years in public safety. I worked as an instructor in the Canadian forces, as a traffic enforcement officer, as a police officer, and even as a homicide detective. Now, I wanted to give you a few random facts about me. I've been a pilot since I was 15 years of age, and I've climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, and yet I am deathly afraid of heights. I'm allergic to chocolate. I'm petrified of moths. And when I was living in the Philippines, I learned that I'm also deathly afraid of flying cockroaches. I also scream like a little girl when they land on me. I ate a glow-in-the-dark rosary when I was a little kid. And yet, 30 years later, it was our Blessed Virgin Mary, our mother, who brought me to know and love her son and to love his church. And the rosary is now a central part of my ministry. Now, when I introduce myself, most people are pretty surprised that I've crammed so many things into my life. Most would guess, based on my resume, that I was maybe a superstar student, that I enjoyed going to school, and was maybe even one of the popular kids. But my friends, what most people don't know is that my childhood was anything but enjoyable. You see, when I was going to school, I didn't fit in at all. I had very few friends, and most of the friends that I had would pretend that they didn't know me when we were at school. I was bullied constantly, and I spent more time with the school counselor than I did with anybody else. I was called out by my classmates because I didn't wear trendy clothes. I wasn't a member of any sports teams. I can't play sports at all. I was shorter than all of the other guys. I wore glasses. I was the kid that didn't get invited to any of the birthday parties. And what most of my classmates really didn't like about me was that I was smart. I was the kid who on Valentine's Day didn't get any Valentines. And what it made it worse is I didn't know how to talk to other kids. I would try really hard, I'd formulate something really funny in my head, but whenever I actually said it, it always came out very awkwardly. My friend Father Paul, who we celebrated the liturgy with this morning, would probably say that that still happens today. To escape my social awkwardness, I just, I read books all the time. It was my escape, my happy place, but having your face buried in a book, it didn't really 
help me with my popularity either. I even got beat up all the time. In one case, I ended up in the hospital for three weeks and in rehab for a year. All of that was happening on the outside, but on the inside, my mind, it was a constant struggle with my desire to fit in and then the realization that I just didn't think the same as other kids. I was constantly comparing myself to what it was to be normal and always coming up short. I'd love to say that my experience is unique, yet sadly it's not. Many of you have or may be experiencing similar challenges. Many of you may be calm on the outside, yet struggling on the inside. The simple truth is it's really hard to be a kid. I can tell you that it gets better and it does. I can tell you that as an adult, I reach back to those challenges and they strengthen me. They make me more empathetic. They give me a drive to be kind to others. But for some of you right now, childhood is going to be very challenging. I know this because I've watched kids grow up. I've watched my own children grow up. I've seen children in my ministry as a camp director, as a deacon, and I've journeyed with many youth who struggle today. And what makes it worse, I don't think the adult world really understands or gives enough attention to the contemporary experience of our youth. Our schools, your teachers here especially, they're doing an amazing job of bringing this to the attention of the world. But in general, we still have a long ways to go. In our defense as adults, we're used to relying on the experiences of our childhood of our past to help us engage with the youth of today. Yet for possibly the first time in history, we as adults can't rely on our childhoods to give insight into your life. Your world looks so differently from the world that we grew up in. In talking to my own children, I'm constantly amazed at how complex your world is. Social media changes to family, constantly changing social norms. The difference between your culture and the one your parents were formed in is more different than in any previous generation. Now, it's easy to get caught up in all this change, to feel adrift and to feel like nothing is permanent. Nothing is concrete in this world. We can get caught up in trends and five minutes, five seconds of TikTok fame, constantly chasing what it is to be popular. And in doing so, we can forget one very important truth. There is something in this life that doesn't change. There is one thing that is timeless. There is one thing that is experienced the same in your youth as it was in my youth, as has been forever. That thing is the love that our Lord has for each and every one of us. I say that again, our Lord, Jesus Christ, loves each and every one of us. A very simple statement. But I also know that these words will be heard by each of you differently. For some of you, you grew up singing the lullaby, Jesus loves me. And when you sing the words, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. You believe those words and you know that you are loved. You've grown up with the sacraments. You've grown up attending mass. You've grown up in a loving family. You have felt God working in your life. Always there journeying with you in the good times and in the bad. But for others, it's a different story. For some, you may roll your eyes and laugh at those words. For some, the thought that our God, the creator of heaven and earth, this person you have never met, the thought that he loves you? Well, how can you believe that when some of you don't even experience that in your own families? For some, you've not had the support of the sacraments, or maybe church teaching has challenged your relationship with God, or maybe someone has treated poorly, treated you poorly in the name of Christ, or maybe you just simply haven't felt God's presence in your life. 
For some, when I tell you that Jesus loves you, it just plain doesn't make sense. Now, I only have a short time with you today, and while I wish I could take away all those barriers between you and your understanding and appreciation of God's love, I simply can't do that today. All I can tell you is that regardless of how you feel or what you have experienced so far in your lives, Jesus does love you. And he doesn't just love you in a collective sense, like when we say that God loves all of his creation. It's not some generic or group sense, the plural you. It's a deeply personal individual love. He loves each and every one of you just as you are. You see, each and every one of you was created to be unique. Now, we live in a very scientific world that says that it might be just an accident, just chance, that you're simply the product of your genes and environmental factors. But in science, you may have learned, or you may yet to learn, that even while identical twins may share the same DNA, their fingerprints are different. There are no two people created exactly the same and never will be. And that's not an accident. It's not just a matter of chance or environmental factors or genetics. In the book of the prophet Jeremiah, God tells us, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Our Lord knows us more than anyone else ever will. The Gospel of Luke tells us that God knows us in such detail that he can count the number of hairs on our head. The prophet Isaiah tells us that God knows us like the palm of his hand. Now, King David spoke of this beautifully in Psalm 139, and so I want you to listen carefully to this psalm. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even... Before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. You see, God created each and every one of us just as we are. He created you unique, never to be reproduced again, not by accident, not by some mathematical or scientific process or chance, but for a specific purpose. The book of Proverbs says, the Lord has made everything for its purpose. We're going to talk about purpose in a few minutes, but for right now, it's enough to know that when you look in the mirror and see that face looking back at you, it is a face that represents a person lovingly fashioned, knit together as we just heard, fearfully and wonderfully made, your life known and important to God. No matter what the world tells you, there is no one that the Lord loves more than you. And here's another thing to think about. God didn't just create the world and then moved on to his next project. Philosophers and theologians will tell you that God holds all things in existence by an act of his will. Another way to say that is that if God stopped thinking about his creation it would simply cease to exist. It is because of God thinking about you that you exist. It is because God is thinking about you, each and every one of you, that you are here listening to my words today. Knowing that God, 
the creator of the universe is thinking about you every moment of the day, knowing that, why is it that so many of our youth don't appreciate their importance? If I asked you at the beginning of this talk, do you think today at this very moment you play an integral part in God's plan of salvation, his plan to get us all to heaven? I bet most of you have said you play a small role or maybe not even a role at all. I think part of why you don't appreciate your importance is that it's just part of being a kid. You have a short period of time, 18 years legally, to which you are the direct responsibility of your parents. With your parents being ultimately responsible for you, always being there as a backup, it's easy to disregard your importance. I also think part of the reason why our youth discount their importance, their worth, is because we allow others to discount our importance, our worth. We allow our belief that our actions define in our youth, we make a lot of mistakes. And if we're not careful, we can allow that to influence our sense of self. If I fail a test, it means I'm dumb. If I hurt somebody, it means I'm unkind. If I don't think like everyone else, it means that I'm not normal. My friends, I really want you to challenge that narrative that just because you are kids, you are somehow less important in the eyes of God. I want you to challenge the belief that our actions define our worth, our importance, our uniqueness in the eyes of God. If you fail a test, it doesn't mean that you're dumb. Rather, it means that you might need to do some more studying or you might need to have I don't know, you might need to have somebody read things because you're an audible learner, or it might be just be that your strengths are in another subject. If you hurt somebody, it doesn't mean that you're unkind. Yes, if you hurt somebody, you need to fix that. You need to fix the hurt that you've done, but it doesn't mean that you have less value than anyone else. And if you don't think like everyone else, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It simply means that you're unique. That God in his loving diversity has given us another fresh perspective, your perspective in which to see the world. Our worth is not defined by our actions. Rather, our worth is rooted in the fact that we are fashioned in every detail by a God who loves us. We are made in the image and likeness of a God who is love. And who from the moment he formed us prepared a place for us in heaven. There is a catch, though, and it's important to realize that, though. Just because our Lord loves us infinitely, it doesn't mean that we're free to act in any way that we please. Our loving and forgiving God doesn't necessarily love our actions. There is still right and wrong. Society has become pretty loosey-goosey on what is right and wrong these days. To be a Catholic to be a Christian, to follow Jesus is definitely much more challenging. But my friends, it's really important to separate our actions from who we are, and no matter what one does, to always respect the dignity that we have. For some, the way they are made, following the teachings of Jesus Christ is really easy. And for some, Following the commandments of Jesus is really hard. But my friends, our salvation is something that's worth the effort. And our Lord has promised to be with us every step of the way. Becoming saints is worth the sacrifice. Now, some of you may say, Deacon Ryan, I'm only a kid. How can I be a saint? That's a great question. And to answer it, I'm simply going to point you to the growing number of our youth who are living heroically virtuous lives and who are being recognized by the church for it. Blessed Carlos Acutis, Blessed Chiara Bodano, Servants of God Chiara Petrillo, to name a few. These are the young people on their way to becoming saints, youth just like you who played video games, who struggled to remain faithful in a crazy world, and yet attained holiness. 
And my friends, we sometimes overcomplicate things. Jesus boiled his commandments down to two great commandments. The first, to love God. And the second, to love others as you love yourself. A path to holiness, a path that even our youth can attain. Now, I mentioned that you were formed for a purpose. Many of you have heard talks about vocations. I was just in a class earlier where the questions were, what is it like to be a priest? What is it like to be a deacon? Married life, the priesthood, religious life, these tend to be the focuses of vocational talks. But one that is often missing from the agenda is the vocation of our youth. What is the purpose of our youth? Rather than me standing here presenting to you, it should be you presenting to me. But the thing is, most youth don't even realize that you have an important vocation. Most of our youth would agree that God has a plan for you. But many of you say that you don't need to worry about that until you're older, until you graduate school. I'm going to say to you today that your vocation has already started. Your work in bringing heaven here on earth has already begun. In realizing this, there's a consequence though. It means to, that you need to appreciate that what you do today really matters. Even the small things our Lord asks of you today can have a huge impact on his plan. To illustrate this, some of you may have heard of the butterfly effect. It's been hijacked a little bit by movies, and it's typically presented as a scenario where you travel back in time, and you make a small change, and then you come to the future and realize that the present has completely been changed. A small change in history is magnified and can change the entire future. Scientists, specifically physicists, look at it from a different perspective. They speak about the butterfly effect as in a butterfly beating its wings here in Canada. The change in pressure formed by its wings beating can actually influence and or create a storm halfway around the world. We aren't talking about you beating your wings today. And this isn't some warm fuzzy thing about paying it forward this is really about this is really science small changes have big effects and the butterfly effect can take something as simple as a smile or a kind word and it can send positive ripples further than you can ever imagine what this means is that on the path of salvation history from Genesis, where we saw God creating the heavens and the earth, through to Jesus coming again in glory, each and every one of us has an integral and irreplaceable role to play. And my friends, your role has already started and is just as important as your teachers, your parents, me standing before you today, or anyone else here on earth. Who you are matters, and what you do matters. So how do we live out that vocation? Well, one of the most important ways that you, as our youth, live out that vocation is as teachers. And it starts right at your birth. Who are your students? The world. I know this one sounds about a bit odd, but hear me out on this one. You help to form the vocation of adults. You help to form my vocation. You help to form the vocation of your parents. You help to form the vocation of your teachers. First, and this one's pretty obvious, without our youth, without children, there wouldn't be any vocations, period. But more than that, through your need to be guided, through your need to be nurtured, formed, you hone the skills of adults in living out their vocations. This would be a great moment to cue the Lion King's Circle of Life theme song in how all things come around. But another, and I would argue more important way, is that your perspective, 
the perspective of our youth often helps to reorientate and refocus, to reprioritize the attention of adults. Jesus told us, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It is through your witness that adults can learn this lesson from Jesus. It is because you that I have a chance to go to heaven. So how do you help me spiritually become like a child? Well, for example, adults are long-term thinkers. Some adults start planning their retirement when they turn 18, when they start their first job. And that's not a bad thing, but we can get so focused, so caught up on looking down the road that we forget what is right in front of us. You, my friends, remind us to live in the moment, to be grateful for the gifts that our Lord bestows on us today, and sometimes just to let loose and have some fun. Our youth remind us that we must shed the weight of all the worldly concerns that are going on and to be joyful. It is our youth who remind us to be humble, to be receptive, to be teachable, to trust. Your vocation is also directed at your friends, your classmates, your family. I loved earlier how Father Leo said, if you surround yourselves with bullies, you will likely become a bully yourself. We've already talked about the key to this part of your vocation, and it's really simple, my friends. You are called to love. You're called to love your classmates. You're called to love your friends. You're called to love your family. We need to love the stranger on the street. We need to love people regardless of how they dress or how they talk or what version of iPhone they have or how they live their life. There are lots of ways in which we engage the world differently from our peers. Some are going to engage in behaviors that we don't agree with or even ones that we know are sinful. But my friends, one of the key aspects of our vocation is to always, always interact with others in a manner that acknowledges their dignity as sons and daughters of God and recognizes that no matter what they do, they have just as important a role in God's plan as we do. My friends, when I started this talk, I talked about my youth having many challenges. It's only through hindsight, it's only through me looking back, only through that perspective that I realized that all of those challenges that I experienced were not just preparing me for my role in God's plan, it was part of his plan. Maybe all of the things I experienced were simply to bring me to this moment with you here today, to give me the opportunity to tell you from the bottom of my heart that you are all beautiful. You are all unique creations of God. When you look in the mirror, don't judge yourself against what you see in advertisements, what you think the world expects you to be. Be who you are. Be the person God lovingly knits you together in your mother's womb to be. And then love, my friends, love. Love your God, love yourself, love your family, love your friends, love your enemy, become a saint. Own your role, own your role in God's plan. And finally, I'd ask that you pray for me, just as I'll be praying for you in Thanksgiving that I have you as my teacher to remind me of joy, of purity, of humility. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you so much, Deacon Ryan. That was a beautiful, beautiful talk. Um, and and it really shows us that, you know, what the purpose of today is, is you guys, you know, for you to know that you are a member of our school community, that you are a member of our family, and that you have a special place in God's heart and in our hearts. And uh, it's a time for you guys to grow and to learn. Uh, so thank you very much, Deacon. That was beautiful. Um, now we are going to watch the video that Father Rob has made for us. Um, there is parts where he is going to tell us that we have to stop and he asks questions and we have to reflect. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy it and enjoy the rest of the day.